Hello. One minute early, right on time. All right, you can get a sign right here. Yeah, they're waiting for your broccoli. Yeah, they're big yeah. Yeah. They wanted me to forge on your paste. It's actually like coming. I just talked to them. You're very patriotic. <coughs> Dump the clutch out on this pretty quick. Six bells. We're going to call the County Board of Commissioners meeting towards. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Commissioner McCann. Here. Commissioner Baldwin. Here. Commissioner Beeden. Present. Commissioner Dunn. Here. Commissioner Rushing. Here. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Here. Commissioner Bohm. Here. Item three, additions, deletions, changes to the agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to add uh, intercept agreement for the Economic Development Alliance of St. Clair County. I'd like to add quarantine to unfinished business for 10A. And I believe you want to have the audit as 7D. Uh, yes. What was it, 70? 70 will be 11A, yeah, the okay. audit, audited financial statements. So audit's going under consent agenda? Yeah, we're going to do that. She, yes. She's got another meeting this evening, so. We have that motion with those changes. Uh, I'll second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Approval of the agenda. Make a motion we approve as presented with the changes. Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed. Item five minutes, previous meetings A and B. Uh, Mr. Chair, at this time I'd like to make a motion to approve and file the minutes of the 8 19 21 Commission meeting and the 9 2 21 Standing Committee meeting. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Item six, proclamations. Item A, dedicating the William Jowat Memorial Rain Gardens Bioswale. Duke, you have that? And I saw Mr. and Mrs. Jowat in Jowett attendance here, along sir. with um, um, Drain Commissioner Wiley. Come on up there. Get your five seconds of fame on TV, buddy. <laughs> well, <laughs> a couple minutes. Yeah, a couple minutes. Uh, this is a proc uh, proclamation dedicating the William Jowett Memorial Rain Garden slash Bioswale. Whereas William Bill Jowett was born and raised in St. Clair County and was a lifetime public servant and tireless advocate for the people he served. And whereas William, or as when Bill graduated from Port Huron High School in 1952, he attended Port Huron Junior College for two years and served in the United States Army in Germany. Bill graduated from Cincinnati Mortuary Science in 1957 and was a lifelong Port Huron Area Funeral Director and the former St. Clair County Coroner from 1958 to 1962, and a 55-year Funeral Director license. He was a multi-client government consultant from 1980 until retired in 2006. Whereas Bill was elected into the Michigan House of Representatives in 1966, Bill Jowett represented the people of Port Huron and St. Clair County in the House for 14 years and where Bill Jowett served on the Appropriation Committee and worked diligently to secure essential funding for St. Clair County Community College and other public projects in the district. Now, therefore, it be proclaimed that the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners, on behalf of its citizens, does hereby dedicate the Rain Garden Bioswale located at Merchant and McMoran Boulevard in Port Huron as the William L. Jowett Memorial Rain Garden Bioswale for Bill's devotion and public service to the citizens of St. Clair County. Signed, Jeff Baum, Chairman, Greg McConnell, Duke Dunn, Georgia Baldwin, Vice Chair, Lisa Beeden, Dave Rushing, and Dave Vandenbosch. Congratulations. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Baum, all the members of the, the uh, County Commission, it means a lot to me, my wife, and my kids. Um, 
you know, he worked very hard for the county, um, trying to get a lot of, as much money from the state as he could. Um, he passed away nine years ago, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, item 7A through D on the consent agenda. I think agenda. we voted on that. Do we need to vote on that? Not necessary. Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, I, oh. A motion on consent agenda. I would look for a motion to approve item 7A through 7D on the consent agenda. Support. Uh, discussion on any of them. We do have a presentation on D, which is going to be the um, audit financial statements. All right, um, thank you and good evening. Um, thank you for inviting UHY to come present um, the financial results of 2020 for you this evening. My name is Karen Shafiq um, and I am the partner on the engagement. We were on site beginning in April or so and really wanna commend the county for um, all their hard work getting everything ready for us, um, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna spend the majority of tonight's time, um, at least that I'm up here, I'm focusing on the general fund for you guys. Um, the presentation packet that you do have has a lot more information in it on all the other funds, um, so if you have any questions on any of that, let me know, um, but again, I'll primarily be focusing on the general fund of the county. Um, the first part of the approximate 200-page report um, of the audit is the independent auditor's report. This is the only part of the report that is UHYs. Um, you do have an unmodified opinion, um, which is the best that you can have, a clean opinion, um, and really stating that your financial statements are reported in accordance with GAAP. Um, you did receive the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for 2019, and this 2020 report has also been submitted. Um, so I'll just really jump right into the combined general fund balance sheet. Um, on the presentation packet, you can see that there are comparative amounts, um, but I'm gonna really kind of focus on 2020 here. Um, the assets at the end of December for the general fund were at $21,097,950. Liabilities and deferred inflows of resources were at $8,417,589 leaving a fund balance of $12,680,361 at the end of December. Um, the general fund, when looked at on a budget basis, had revenues for the year of $56,737,292, um, expenditures of 50,000, or sorry, 50 million, $60,664,706, and other financing sources and uses we're at a um, negative $5,905,440, um, giving a net change in your fund balance of your general fund when you look at it on a budget basis of $167,146. Um, the budget incentive fund um, had a change in fund balance of a negative $102,990, and the development revolving fund had no change in fund balance. So looking at your general fund in a combined basis, um, the fund balance had a positive change of $64,156. Um, at December 31, fund balance is really split into several categories. Um, details are listed on page 102 of your financial statements, as well as on page two of the um, packet that you should have in the agenda. Um, but the fund balance, um, had non-spendable amounts of $2,189,045, committed amounts <coughs> of $1,132,012, assigned um, fund balance was at $133,425, and unassigned fund balance was at $9,225,879, which can really be used um, for general purposes of the company. Um, there are also two required letters um, that we issued. They are the report on internal control as well as the management letter. Um, we have gone over these letters with management and they're also included in your um, financial report packet that you have. 
And then really the remainder of that presentation packet in the agenda there um, is really summarized information for the other county funds, um, as well as some pie charts and graphs just kind of regarding um, the general fund revenues and expenditures and fund balance through the years. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. If I could talk. <laughs> I normally try to find one error in it, and uh, I didn't, so. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I think last year I found our error. Oh, no. <laughs> That's no good. It was humorous, but why do you even that? Anyways. Okay. Anything else? I'd be remiss if I didn't say I've been here since 04. Obviously went through the biggest downturn that we've ever had, you know, in history of, right? Probably since the Great Depression. We've always weathered the storm. We've increased our fund balance in the 17 years that I've been on the board. We've maintained very good uh, bond ratings. We've increased our bond ratings. Um, some of you recently went to our actuarial uh, report. We have a um, very strong um, report on our unfunded liabilities, the things that traditionally here most governmental agencies are struggling with. So. Kudos to Carrie, as many of you know before, pre her being our administrator, she was our financial person. Uh, previous to that was Bob Kemp. And ultimately, at the end of the day, as county commissioners, keeping the, you know, to me, the number one thing is keeping the financial integrity of the organization in check. And, and Carrie and the staff has done a very good job about with that. So um, that's just my narrative. Any other questions at all? When, when we have funds like in the delinquent tax fund <coughs> so there's a large amount of money that's in that fund but that's not considered excess that's all spoken for is that yeah well that's restricted for whatever the levy is for if it's parks and rec it can only be spent on parks and rec programs um same with library or anything like that so so when the money show up in those accounts and it's not, so if we have 300,000 that we didn't spend in Parks and Rec, that goes into their fund, it doesn't show up in our fund balance. Correct, that is not in the general fund, right. right? Yep. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. I guess you just brought up that the delinquent tax funds, the treasurer collects that, but we control it as county commissioners. It doesn't go, please explain it. Uh, do you wanna explain that? So the funds in the delinquent tax fund are to make the local units whole for all of those delinquent taxes. The treasurer does have to declare there to be a surplus. And if there is a surplus, then it is for the Board of Commissioners to decide how to spend that. Um, they, if there's not a surplus, those funds have to stay in the delinquent tax fund. Because I know we had a surplus, that's what I was thinking. And we control the prior. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let you get your Thank next meeting. Thank you very meeting. much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, reports of standing special committees. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Going on, uh, uh, item eight, reports of special standing committees. Uh, David, item, uh, you start with you, David Van Bosch. Um, don't think I've got, I mean, we've had a, we had a very successful event down in Marine City, thanks to Jeff, and uh, we were able to raise uh, $6,500 for our local schools and uh, athletic program, and another 4,000 for our local Lions Club. So helped us with a little bit of debt that they've occurred in the last few years, but thanks to Jeff and uh, playing a big part of it. And uh, it was a good event. Yeah. And, uh, we're already Thank scheduling you. again for next year, so. David? Uh, just something quick. I want to, because I do support our road commission, I think they did a very heads up job on the storm. We had a pretty good washout on Boardman Road just east on Memphis uh, in St. Clair County, and uh, they got right on that. I'm sure they had many issues within the county with that storm that passed through. In addition, uh, our county road commission is working with an Eagle Scout out of Richmond, and he's going to be getting his Eagle Award as a Eagle Scout. So just thank you to the road commission. Okay. Nope. Yeah, just one thing. This Saturday, the 25th at 1 p.m. at the uh, Columbus County Park, they're having a uh, disc golf dedication uh, for the many families that donated money and stuff. So if anybody's available, I'm sure everybody would love to see us. That's all. Craig? Um, <clears throat> we had Central Dispatch meeting this morning, and 
Um, I, I don't know if all of you know, I don't know how far this email goes out, but we, our 911 was down. Um, it was actually non-existent. It, it went dark, what Tina said. She's been here 15 years, and she doesn't know if it ever happened before. They've always lost an item, you know, but this time they lost everything they had. They couldn't communicate. Um, and today some parts came in. and um, So I don't know. There's some things that some some double features that they want to add so that when we have the we have the generator that automatically kicks in in 45 seconds but that 45 second delay can't happen because it shuts all the computers down so there's uh, is it the UPS the UPS UPS okay and so that that malfunctioned and that's battery backup and that's supposed to run it until the generator comes on well when it kicked in and didn't work, it held everything in its memory, basically, so it pulled all our phones and computers and everything down, and they couldn't get them to, even though when the power went back up, they still weren't able to utilize it, and it took them a while to get it figured out, but then it burned out four servers. At the same time, whether that was, don't know what the correlation is, but they got some of them in today, and I think we got an email just recently stating, stating that we're back up to full capacity. If it's not full capacity, we're fully operational. Um, so when that went down, I, I don't know, some of the commissioners may know this, but uh, LaPierre's our backup. We have that agreement with LaPierre. Um, were they able to flip the calls over to them, or was it, did that? It went to LaPierre, and there was, there was a couple. You know, it, as anything, you have all these plans in place, and until you actually try them. Um, so they got some of our calls. Fortunately, they... They were able to call some of the fire departments. I think they called Fort Gratiot because they had a couple of calls in Fort Gratiot. So they physically, on a, on a landline, called Fort Gratiot Fire Department and said, listen, you know, you've know, you got these calls, and they went out there. And so the calls that got transferred were taken care of. Um, so it, it, it did work. So I mean, the biggest glitch, I think, was the non-emergency lines being down create a lot of havoc. And when people call in on the non-emergency lines and they can't get through, then it becomes an emergency. And so there was a lot of issues with that. So good learning experience, if nothing else. And um, they're gonna try to do some more testing and if they can on, on this equipment. Some of their handheld radios, they found out that were, you know, they hadn't, <coughs> they work and they use them, but they don't, use them for extended periods of time. So when you use your handheld, the batteries depleted very fast and it didn't matter before because they only needed them for a minute, two minutes or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Well, when they needed them for a few hours, they, the batteries went down. So um, even though they were plugged in and said they were charged, they were old and, and didn't hold their, their shelf life. So they got new batteries put in and so they're, they're working, but at least it's up and operational again, and I, I give them credit. Um, there was a lot, a lot of hours put in, um, like complete days. What, what Tina, she was there 36 hours straight um, trying to get things going. So um, I give a lot of credit there. Georgia? I do. Uh, so two things, and um, just for maybe to pass out to your areas too. The county master plan uh, is still asking for information um, and feedback. So there is a link on the uh, county's website and for anyone to public, everybody to, to fill out, but it asks questions about what you wanna see in your community from a land use standpoint, things like that. Uh, so still looking for that information. It's on the left-hand side of the uh, and um, the same with the gypsy moth recording. So to make sure that we're still pushing that message out to get, so, you know, it. Now that they've all gone dormant, it's, you know, you're not really thinking about it. So just to make sure, I guess my, my ask is to push that information out to make sure. Have a estimated area. time frame with Michigan State University working on a gypsy moss? Or what? An estimated time frame where they're going to have a report on the potential of what we're going to do next year. Well, they, they don't do, they don't start the canvassing of areas until November. Okay. So, well, yeah. So November, I have an email they, today and yeah. want to answers to that yes yeah, so the, the canvassing is most effective when they do it in november that's when you can start to do the maps 
then uh, they'll go back and look again. And then, you know, if there's some kind of spray program that's recommended, it wouldn't happen until April, May. So that's, that's kind of the time frame. Okay. Lisa? Uh, after our last uh, commissioner meeting, um, the health department did put up the FAQ. So thank you to um, Dr. Mercantile and her team, and of course, all the commissioners and the public that submitted questions. Those are available online. Um, the community health assessment is also underway. Um, so we should have that report end of the year um, to really see um, the needs of the community. And then um, just flu vaccine or the flu season is, is on us. So you'll start seeing that pushed out through the health department and, and your local um, physician. So there's lots going on. Okay. Uh, two things here for me. The, we had a meeting on September 9th down in East China. We have that 26 mile road corridor committee, if you want to call it. It's Dan Casey, Dave Strzok, Steve Katzen, who's a planning uh, guy, um, Kurt Weston and Bill Hazelton. That agreement went out and we've got some, um, well, some respondents to that, but I actually received a call from East China to talk about, to look at the King Road corridor about other potentials t tying in. We met, actually had officials from Marine City down there really to take even a more comprehensive look at, yes, 26 mile road, but can East China, you know, pull some capacity, which actually even ties into the equation of St. Clair because St. Clair's kind of maxed out right now. Um, so are we able to divert some of theirs to East China? So there's a lot of conversations going on in that Southern part as far as who can take what, who can do, because um, right now, for example, in St. Clair, um, if they were to have any growth, which would potentially be in St. Clair Township, like where that magna plant went in and that stuff, they probably don't have any, they don't have sufficient capacity to pick up anything, right? So you really have to strategically look to see who's got what. And I can, I can tell you that everybody's talking, they understand it. Everybody gets it for the greater good. 15 years ago, we've never had this conversation. I can assure you that it would have been, you know, mine, 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 mine kind of stuff, which doesn't do you any good. So everybody's. Um, um, you can drive by that magna plant for the first time or just it's a chin dropper. I mean, it's just ten and a, ten and a half months. That comes back to shovel ready projects. That project by the time they bought the core and knocked it down up running producing 370,000 square foot full production building built not a hundred percent staffed but it'll be 85 percent staffed ten and a half months that's how quick a time frames that these automotive things are under so that's why if we're going to play in that game you've got to you got to have these sites uh, October 20th, I'm going to be downtown Detroit to do the final pitch on the Marine City uh, Marina project. We went and talked to DNR Trust Fund. As everybody knows, they've identified a piece of property down there. It went really well. Um, we kind of left a map out to identify some future potential growth parcels. So all we're going to go back is, is take the mapping so they get a better aerial of what this is phase one, phase two phase three, but it was very well received. So keep our fingers crossed. Are it's, they voting on the 20th? Is no, um, you, they'll, they'll, they'll write a, shortly after that, you'll know if you get funded or not. I think it might be that December time frame. Okay. They just had asked some questions and we answered them, but it's a lot better to be able to walk in there with an aerial and show them, you know, exactly what we were talking about. We had some aerials, but this is, this is a much better alignment. So uh, with that being said, let's go on to, on, in regards to 26 mile road corridor, uh, that's both my townships over that area. If I could be included in the yeah. conversation and invited to the meetings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, right now they're go going to pick somebody to look into, when I say study, it's to really identify water, sewer, electric, to this, to that. To, you know, I mean, everybody's- They're gonna have planners and Dave Struck very much involved, but it doesn't yeah. affect the town. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, okay, we're going to move on. Uh, citizens wishing to uh, address the board. Uh, Geneva Bivens, uh, 812 Port Heron, resolution. Good evening, everyone. My name is Geneva Bivens. I'm a St. Clair County resident. 
I would like to thank everyone for being here tonight, and I would like to thank the commissioners that responded to my email, as well as one that made some recommendations to be on this. I will let that commissioner decide whether they wish to disclose that information, and I'll just get right into it. Whereas the citizens of St. Clair County being both informed about the risks and benefits of available medical treatments such as vaccines, as well as maintaining the sacred and inalienable right to make autonomous choices about their own health are essential to securing both the general welfare and securing the blessings of liberty as they are protected by the Constitution, excuse me, of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And whereas we, the Board of Commissioners for St. Clair County, believe that the medical decisions of citizens are best made in consult with our healthcare professional who is knowledgeable of the citizen's health history, and whereas quarantines will not be supported, nor will contact tracing or vaccine passports be supported. Therefore, let it be resolved, St. Clair County messaging henceforth related to vaccines shall encourage citizens to discuss the risks and benefits of any such treatment with their chosen healthcare provider, and be it further resolved, St. Clair County shall not question any citizen's claim or parents' claim on behalf of their children to exemption from wearing a face mask or any other similarly mandated activity and be it further resolved, St. Clair County shall not require of or mandate to any employee, respective employee or contractor, any form of vaccine or similar medical treatment verification or COVID-19 test verification as a general condition of employment and will not encourage employers located within St. Clair County to establish such mandates that so hinder medical autonomy and be it further resolved, the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners does hereby encourage citizens of St. Clair County to continue to increase their awareness of available preventative measures and therapies by discussing the risks and benefits of available preventative measures and therapies with their chosen healthcare provider. I made some changes to this after sending it to all of you, so I will send the revised copy in the morning. Thank you. Sean Treadway, COVID Board Answers. Sean? Chairman, thank you. Commissioners, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the comments from corporate counsel last week. During last <coughs> meeting, he took the time to tell us about his grandchildren and all they gave up. We know all about the things that were taken away from all of us in the past 18 months. We don't need to hear it from a contract and employee. Next, he stated that they would update the FAQs and questions um, that we, the people, had and add them to the website. Um, most of what was added, from what I can see, are just regurgitated statements from the CDC and Health Department. He didn't even answer the questions that came from Commissioners Rushing and Vandenbosch. Also, as he spoke, he continued to use the word we when describing quarantine order, the possible discrimination between vaxxed and unvaxxed, recommending the order, and feelings that uh, the warning letters were appropriate. Who are the we that he speaks of? Uh, shouldn't these type of discussions happen at the meetings? Are these discussions that affect the citizens of the county being discussed between the council and the health department? Are there meetings between some board members and not others? Board members, are you present during any of these discussions? Should these discussions and decisions be made in front of the public? Is corporate council applying the same rules to the other schools that he represents? And shouldn't council be advising and not deciding? Council's own words imply that he is on the decision-making team and not the represent and advising team. Uh, has there been any other commissioners besides Mr. Rushing and Mr. Vandenbosch with the intestinal fortitude to publicly express their opinion or questions on any of the COVID orders? I asked at the last meeting where you all stood. No answers yet. Are we not worthy of your answers? Will we hear from you tonight maybe? Will you let us know where you stand on the COVID orders? If I'm not mistaken, you all served two years as commissioners. Our group as patriots grows larger and larger by the day, and you can guarantee that most every one of you will face primary challenges next August. We understand that these are difficult decisions, but we demand strong leaders who are not afraid to speak up and speak out. 
You cannot remain mute behind your dais any longer. We will take back the people's seats with individuals that represent us. We, the silent majority, will no longer remain silent. Thank you. Kim Hortop. Hi, good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, my husband uh, was called in for jury duty, and he came back and he told me that they were pretty much packed in there like sardines. No care in the world for masks or social distancing, nothing, but yet we continue to treat the children like they're diseased cattle and shove things up their nose all the time, which is child abuse, by the way. Um, it, to me, it was determined at the last meeting that the warning letter to me, it seemed like it sounded like a bunch of BS, that she couldn't do what she was saying in the letter. So I'd like to read the US Code 18, Title 18, 1001. A, whoever in any, in any matter within jurisdiction of the executive, legislator, or judicial, excuse me, legislator or judicial branch of the government of the United States knowingly and willingly, one, falsifies, conceals, or covers up by any trick, scheme, or device, um, or, or a material fact. Two, makes any material false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representation. Three, or makes or uses any false writing or document knowing the same to contain any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements or entry, shall be fined under this title imprisonment not more than five years, or if the offense involves international or domestic terrorism, as defined in section 2331, imprisonment not more than eight years or both. In section 2331, number five, the term domestic terrorism means activities that, under part B, appear to be, uh, appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civ civilian population. So what are we going to do about this? Is she going to jail? What? She's breaking the US code. It is domestic terrorism what she is doing. And I, you guys better stand up and do something about this lady. Because we're all sick of it. We're all sick of it. It's a bunch of BS and we know it. And I'm pretty sure some of you know it too. That mask does nothing for you, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Marcy McClelland. Thank you. Um, Last, the last meeting when I was here, I had um, submitted some FOIA requests from different places in the county, and I hadn't gotten a chance to get that back from them. So tonight, I just want to share a few things that I received. So the first one I received from my school, which is Yale Public Schools, was I had asked them several different questions about quarantining last year and contact tracing and what their numbers came back, and if they came back positive after being quarantined. So what the information they gave me, which took them a lot of time to compile this, which was very surprising to me because it just seems like if you're, if, especially if our health director is gonna put this out there, you would think the information is readily available. Well, when I FOIA it from the county, they said it's all the state. So. You would think they would want to let your citizens know this is what's happening. We have so many that this is why we're doing this. Well, they directed me to the state, which that will take a long time, I'm sure, to get from them. So anyways, in Yale, we had um, 54 cases that required contact tracing and 11 cases that did not require contact tracing. So 65 total cases in our school, 65 out of four different school buildings. So of the 54 cases that required the school to conduct close contact tracing, they quarantined 1,103 students. So for 65 
students that had to be quarantined, it, that affected 1,103 of our students at Yale Public Schools. That's outrageous. It probably some of those were multiple times, honestly, because there was enough kids at school that were doing it over and over. So the school came back to an estimate. This was an estimate is all they could do. That possibly two to four students became positive during the quarantining. Only two to four out of quarantining 1,103 students. They said this was because in some circumstances it was believed that the case developed from school, but it couldn't be confirmed of the two to four, whether it was in school or maybe while they were quarantined, that they got positive. They're, they, that's why they said it was an estimate. Because we all know if you have kids who are quarantined, they're not staying home. <laughs> they're at the movies or they're at the mall or they're at their friends or sports or whatever. So they're not staying home, especially not now that so many things are open. These kids are not sitting home doing nothing. So um, they told me, I also asked them how many were hospitalized. They don't have that. I asked them how many were wrongfully quarantined. They said they don't have that because I have a son who was wrongfully quarantined and they don't even have that documented. So about 10 seconds. Please. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on then to my other thing here because I'm concerned about these three letters that our state has received about 1.5 million in our county. I mean, has received 1.5 million towards COVID issues. 516,000 of that being for contact tracing quarantining. Please, uh, and if you, are, yeah. if you are going to do this contact quarantining, then you need to disperse that money. How it says right here, it says that you can give it for isolation and quarantine for families, including rent, mortgage, utilities, groceries. So if you're going to send these letters out and uh, quarantine these students, please, please close it up. Then, then you... So then you need to give um, that money to these families. If you're going to quarantine these kids, then what are these parents supposed to do for a whole other school year of going through this? And that's 1,000 kids that their parents have to figure out, what are we going to do with these kids? They're losing education. They're losing sports. They're losing significant events. They're losing significant events in their lives that they don't need to because two people came back positive. So I also FOIA the, the, um, the jail, and they said they're not keeping contact. They're not doing contact tracing and all that and providing it to the county because they're just not doing that. They could tell me how many they did, but they're not. Yeah. Um, I also did it to the college. They actually weren't in, in person, so that didn't really affect anything. So I just feel like it, it's we're focusing on these students. Like the seven of you, if any of you become positive, you're supposed to report to the health department that you're positive. Or if you went and had a test, that, that's supposed to be. So then, so then in essence, then the people that you were in contact with are supposed to be notified from the health department that they have to quarantine. So if you're not doing that, if the public's not doing that, why are we doing this in our schools and to our kids? There, there's no reason to be doing this. There's just no, if, if, if my kid is sick, there, there's a difference between quarantining and contact tracing. If my kid is sick, I will keep my kid home. But I don't need to be told, and, and if my kid is in, in close to someone, the health department can let me know, or not the health department, the school can let me know. Just like in years past, I don't know how many you had kids, but, but if you got a letter that your kid was in a class where lice was exposed, you knew. Okay, I know. Do I need to take precautions for my kid? I'll decide that. I can ask my kid, were you close to this person who's now positive? And then I can decide if I need to be, have my son be cautious or my daughter be cautious. So it needs to be a parent's decision on what's happening. And... Um, I don't know. I also want to say that I asked in the St. Clair County FOIA, the public health order says that there was a seven-day test positivity rate of 5.3%. So what is that out of? Is that out of students that were testing positive? Is that out of older adults? They can't tell me. Yeah, about they, 30 seconds. Okay. So they can't, um, they don't have that information or they don't want to share that information. So I just want to also share, this is a book that my son is in college, and he's studying for finance, but this book is called How to Lie with Statistics. <laughs> so I just think that you, 
you really have to look at statistics, and, and she needs to say what that 5% is, and is it out of... Please finish up. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Carolyn Richards. Hi again. So I'm sure many of us are missing volleyball, football, tennis matches, all to be here to make you guys realize that we, you need to stand up what is the end goal of this public health order? Because right now, the public health order states until further order by the public health officer. So what are you, the county commissioners, doing to check up on that public health officer? Are you asking her for the numbers? Asking her for like, okay, what's come from these quarantines? Are you asking her for that data? Because right now she has unilateral power. I'm hearing where it is that be ready to mask again. Like, what the heck? You're, you're talking about how successful fundraisers have been. That is awesome that you're giving back to the community, that we're bringing people into the community and letting people live again. We're seeing these things all wide open, and then we're doing this to the students. It's just, it's unnecessary. Um, that The council, the attorney last week, meeting said um, their job is also to address people's rights. At what point are you going to do that? The section that they're having this public health order, section 333.253, says epidemic, which means widespread. With those cases and quarantines just in Yale, like I don't, that doesn't seem very widespread. And with everything open, we're packing all these stores and stadiums and gyms that's, wide, that's not widespread to me. 333.2451 is the other thing that she mentions, imminent danger. This virus is mostly 99.6% recovery rate. Right now, I know in one particular hospital, there's six suspected COVID patients. Our pediatric population in our region, which covers three counties, um, there was three confirmed hospitalizations in all of those three large counties. When, um, when asked last meeting about vaccinated individuals being asymptomatic and inadvertently spreading the virus, Dr. Mercantant responded, there's no way you can prevent every contagious person from entering an environment. Yeah. That's what we all agree on. About 30 seconds. Please. Okay. I have so much more. There's just, there's just a lot of misinformation. Um, I think that she's not progressing to follow the actual science and data that's out there. So I ask one more time, what is the end game with all of this? When will you, as our elected representatives, our public servants, remember that your first responsibility is to protect the people's rights, not to control our lives? Callista, Callista Harmon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what others have said. Um, commissioners, I ask you to take action. I am very concerned about our health director's ability to lead and make decisions that negatively affect residents based on a complete lack of data and facts. Citizens are questioning her radical decisions to issue discriminatory health advisories. Um, she also stated that there is a potential precursor to a discriminatory health warning. Um, that would eventually lead to civil infractions uh, without due process to unvaccinated residents that choose to not quarantine. I question her authority, I question her unconstitutional demands, and her discriminatory stance against the unvaccinated. I ask you to put forth a motion to reprimand her. 
Not only that, not only that, uh, put forth a motion to remove her uh, for her unprofessional actions. I am evaluated yearly on my performance at my job, on my daily decisions, my data, my professional growth. Um, perhaps we can evaluate the health director's recent performance. As commissioners, I urge you to listen carefully and to use discernment. Decisions need to be made regarding her effectiveness and her ability to do her job appropriately. When the health director was asked several questions about her plan on September 2nd, uh, that meeting, the doctor fumbled through her answers and clearly did not have any solid plan of action. There are seven flaws in her health advisory. I will note all of them. One, her advisory is a verbal threat. Residents do not appreciate this. Her plan of action and her threat of issuing civil infractions is dead in its tracks. Let's review what she said. We have not yet imposed any regulatory authority. These letters are intended to advise people that this is serious and we, should, we are taking our jobs seriously. But quite honestly, the quarantines are short and by the time we reach an individual, their quarantine is over, end quote. Does that make any sense to anyone? You're gonna issue a misdemeanor, but then they're a healthy resident at that point. Um, when will this stop? Number two, the health director went on to say, quote, we would ask the courts to issue a subpoena in an egregious situation to have a resident held against their will, end quote. So I'll ask you all, is there a scientific scale that the health director is using to rate the egregiousness of a COVID positive resident? And what are we going to do to warrant that person with a subpoena, right? Um, the health director. And who are you, huh? Number three, the health director stated that they can hold a resident against their will based on, quote, language that was extracted verbatim from what they've been using for years, end quote. As some of you mentioned before, these health codes are antiquated. They need to be reviewed um, at a legislative le level. That's on you guys. Get to work. Number four, the corporate counsel stated that there was one time when the county had to take action in regards to a resident that was extremely, um, was, had an extremely deadly disease. The corporate counsel also stated that the law enforcement and or the health department cannot issue a misdemeanor without afforded due process. Number five, this is discrimination. Vaccinated residents will not suffer from quarantines. That's it. The health department stated a vaccinate, or sorry, the health director stated a vaccinated individual is exceedingly less likely to get it, end quote. Then why is there a push for a third dose? The health director then admitted the truth about the vaccinated folks. She said, yes, they can transmit it, end quote. But the vaccinated are completely exempt um, from any restrictions or penalties in our county, according to this health advisory. Number six, the health director is threatening civil infractions without any plan to actually enforce it. St. Clair County does not have quarantine facilities. The health director was asked about this. She replied, I would have to refer to corporate counsel. We've never reached that po uh, point, end quote. Number seven, the last flaw in her plan troubles me the most. She admitted that this is a precursor for what's to come. So is she done yet? Is she going to issue a warning? What's to come? Um, we do not appreciate her implementing draconian or discriminatory measures on St. Clair County residents. I have indicated seven flaws in her health advisory that is very concerning. The health department is there to make recommendations and to provide services. That's it. Residents do not want a health director that will abuse her power, discriminate against residents, and issue health threats with an illegitimate plan of action. I'm asking all the commissioners to reflect on her performance. I urge you to put forth a, mor a motion to formally evaluate her, reprimand her, or even terminate her. If I were to make these mistakes at my job, I would be reprimanded and possibly terminated. Who's holding her accountable? I will end with one last quote that the doctor said. Quote, this was a warning. Maybe that was a bad idea. End quote. Thank you. Pam Bensfield.
Good evening. I would like to add as well to what many have said and say, where is the proof? Where are the peer-reviewed studies and clinical trials that support the orders the health department is trying to impose on us? I have yet to see one. To hear any specific one reference at all. Dr. Mercantat holds a question and answer a live session on Facebook every Thursday. And I have asked this question multiple times. Can you just provide us with the studies that you are referencing. My question has conveniently been skipped over every single time. Last week, she mentioned studies supporting her position. She has referenced experts, but doesn't give any specifics. What are these studies? Who are these experts? What data does she have on the efficacy of masks, quarantines, and vaccines? On September 2nd, Dr. Mercantock stated, and I quote on one of her live sessions, there is no way my team and myself can read every piece of literature that is coming out and we don't consider ourselves experts in virology and immunology. We look at the consensus of experts and the body of evidence as best we can and then we base our decisions on that. Shouldn't it be part of her job? and the job of her team, especially if she's handing down health orders, unchecked especially. The body of evidence that I have seen from experts that are peer reviewed and have clinical trials, for example, I just have three, this, for now, they're extensive, but there's a statement from the WHO that was issued in December of 2020, which states, and I quote, the use of a mask alone, even when correctly used, is insufficient to provide an adequate level of protection for an unaffected individual or prevent on onward transmission from an infected individual. I can email you that report. There's also a German study that was released in February which states the physical, psychological, and behavior effects on children. Or, as another lady pointed out, the book on how to lie in statistics, just do the simple math and find out the real numbers on these graphs. There is also, I know Dr. Mercantant will probably come, I'm cherry picking these studies or the doctors, but there's a multitude of board certified doctors. Dr. M Peter McCullough, who is an internist cardiologist, Peter, his resume, resume is extensive. Um, the creator of the PCR test has publicly stated these tests are not to be used. Dr. Michael Yeadon is the former chief scientist and B VP of Pfizer, who has spoken out on the efficacy of the vaccine. Can wrap it up, please. Maybe she is not the best person to be in the position she is to be handing down these health orders. Thank you. Kim, uh, Kim Van Bach. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. You all give me hope being here. Thank you. Uh, first off, the, the data that's on the website, I, I have two bachelors and a master's, and I know that in order to prove one's data, one must have proper documentation to back it up. In order for data to be statistically correct, it must be peer-reviewed. Where is the peer-reviewed data? And in fact, where is the data? I don't really see it. Second, your mandates are not the law. You're the health department. Last I checked, Congress can pass and make laws. This was proven and still is upheld today by the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. The Michigan legislature is, author is authorized by the Michigan Constitution to create and amend laws of the US state of Michigan. Third, you guys are the health department. You're supposed to promote and make recommendations for better health. Does forcing children to wear a diaper across their face for seven to eight hours a day sound like a healthy choice? I have over 13 studies to show that masks do not work, but I'm sure no one will read them. How about quarantining healthy children because they might have caught the flu and they might spread it to others? It doesn't sound like a healthy choice. Kind of sounds like you'd rather make tyranny mandates and unhealthy choices that would hurt people. You're merely puppets in this whole thing with your, whole, your strings being pulled. And in the end, 
Wouldn't you rather have been known for making good choices for our children? Stop pushing these mandates on our children. Fourth, just some things that I've been pondering. I wondered, why didn't we have the flu last year? Did it just go away? <laughs> Went away. Um, what about the homeless? If there's such a pandem pandemic, pandemic, pan sorry, wouldn't it have affected them in a negative manner? Of course, I have no ill will towards the homeless. I wish them well, but something to think about. Why could we take our mask off at tables in restaurants, but our walks to the tables, we have to have them on? It, it's just, and then how many of the current COVID positives have had the COVID vaccine? Like we're, how many died from COVID had underlying uh, medical conditions? I mean, we need to know this, we need to know this data. Uh, so, the, so much of this is just silliness, it's just messing with our minds, so eventually we'll give in to these mandates. And fifth, I won't rest, I, I'll continue to talk about teen mental health, because you guys are, it's, it's, you're hurting our teens, and, and our kids, our children too. You've got about 30 seconds. What is anxiety? The fear of the unknown. According to the National Health, uh, uh, National NIH, one out of five children experience anxiety since 2019. We line up five kids, one of them has anxiety. Let's talk about suicide. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death in the teens and adults, not COVID. Suicide. I have a study, I listed it at the last um, uh, meeting, 50.6% female teens diagnosed at the hospital with suicide attempts went up 50.6% in March through April 2021, compared to the same period in 2019. 50.6% increase of female teens attempted suicides. What are you guys doing? What are, what are our kids are thinking that death is a more viable option. Really, I mean, stop, stop child abusing our children. Stop. Mary Powell. Hi, right, first I'd like to say thank you to the board members, my community, and Representative Beeler for being here. First, I'd like to start with a quote from the Declaration of Independence. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish. Mr. Baum, I'd appreciate it if you stop texting and start I, listening. I take notes on my phone when people talk, I'm not. It looks like you're not paying attention. I'm paying attention, thank you. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem more likely to affect their safety and happiness. With this message, I say to all of you, I doubt any of you will run unopposed ever again. This is something that needs to happen if the continuation of allowing a non-elected official to exercise authority in a oppressive manner to control the citizens of St. Clair County. This morning, I received an email from Senator Dan Lowers. It read, it's frustrating to see some local health departments taking such an aggressive tactic under current circumstances. On the, next, on the text of the statute alone, there is some authority for them there, yes, but they would still have to go to court and show a number of things. Regardless, this heavy-handed action is far more severe than what has been shown to be required to prevent the spread of the virus. This clearly is not about health care; it's about control. It's about control when the government dictates the private health decisions decisions of its citizens. It's about control when the government forces private businesses to make specific statuses a condition of employment. For over a year, officials at all levels have used constantly changing orders and guidances to exert unilateral control over the lives of the residents and the education of our students. Though twice previously vetoed, the legislation is again beginning to advance that would limit to a 28-day how long the state health officials' epidemic orders could last without needing additional approval. Other measures aimed at prohibiting mandates also continue to move forward. I will also be supporting a bill currently being drafted that would make these county positions filled through an elective process in order to increase accountability. Health decisions belong with the individual and I will continue to oppose misguided overreaching measures that through all available means. 
The health department, the CDC, the federal and state local government have overstepped their boundaries for the last 19 months. The continuation of advisories and threats of detaining people is causing issue within our communities. And as board members representing this people of this county, you need to stop allowing it. We were always told that our immune systems need to be exposed to germs and viruses to build and maintain itself. If you could please wrap it up. I'm sorry, who are? Okay. You wonder why there was a spike in cases when mask, mask mandates were removed? Because people had been wearing them for so long that they broke their immune systems down. And now it will take a while to build it back up. The College of Physicians of Philadelphia released recently that all living things are subject to attack from disease casing agents, even bacteria so small that more than a million could fit on the head of a pin, have systems to defend against infection by viruses. This kind of protection gets more sophisticated as organisms have become more complex. The human immune system is essential for our survival in a world full of potentially dangerous microbes and serious impairment of even one of the systems can predispose humans to severe and even life-threatening infections. Now, I will admit I am fully vaccinated with actual vaccines, ones that have been tested for years and years and years. An mRNA shot is not an actual vaccine. Now, at the start of this, 19 months ago, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. Well, I know that many people stayed home, including my family, until our mental health couldn't take it anymore. Then it was, well, if everyone wears a mask, social distances, washes their hands, blah, 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 nothing has worked. Yet we continue to push these practices. And let's talk real fast about these masks, the one you're wearing. The CDC and many research studies have stated that those handmade cloth masks and the store-bought ones only give maybe 2% of protection. I'll take my chances with breathing fresh air. The studies also show that masks can provide larger protection. The only masks that can provide any kind of large protection from the micro small virus is a KN95 or an N95. So when you allow our health director to get the bug up her butt to mandate masks again, remember this, the county and health department needs to provide at no cost to the citizens, KN95 and N95 masks daily to every citizen in the county, plus extras for those who need to change them. Now the safe and effective vaccine. Does anybody really wonder why medical professionals are now without jobs and refusing the vaccine? Those medical professionals that were heroes last year are now zeros. Got about 30 seconds. Now, those people worked without the vaccine, without PPE, without breaks, for what? To be fired when they don't conform to government? This is the reason that hospitals are backed up and it takes hours to be seen. It's not because of overran with COVID patients. It's because they're short-staffed. Beaumont reported yesterday it was due to staffing issues and a lot of non-COVID relation. Well, they made their bed, and now they must lay on it. I lost all trust in our health department. Okay. I lost all trust in our health department when this whole debacle started, but now they've lost all my respect. When this started, I tried to ask questions on her live feed, on her post, on many venues. Finally, I messaged her personally because I wanted to ask the question about mask mandates. She said to me, there is absolutely no reason, medical or not, that one cannot wear a mask. Tell that to a domestic violence survivor who can't have anything over their face. How about, or the little girl who suffers from internal herpes and almost died at the age of one because someone kissed her when they had a cold sore. The hospital here said, it's just a virus. Let it run its course. We took her, thankfully, to a hospital outside of this county. And they said, if we hadn't, she would have died. Now, after a bone marrow biopsy, after tests, after being scoped, they discovered the cold sores down her esophagus that were killing her. Since then, she's now seven, happy and healthy. But since then, we have maybe one to two outbreaks a year. 
In 2020, we had one to two outbreaks a month because she was forced to wear a diaper on her face at school. Please don't be fooled by the health department numbers. They're reporting all probable and confirmed cases. Our health department must report only confirmed cases because adding those extra numbers is just scare tactics. Now, I'm going to finish with this. Look around, everyone, including you wearing your mask. You know you've all now possibly been exposed. And I wish our wonderful health director was here and our legal counsel because we've all now been jam-packed in this room for over 15 minutes. And with her current tyrannical order, she must issue all of us a letter of quarantine. So if you're a family of four, you're looking at how many people having to be quarantined. That means kids missing school, employers missing employees. Mrs. Baldwin, that would mean you missing homecoming tomorrow and seeing your child on the field in the band and homecoming court. It would mean that Mr. Fletcher and his grandson, he would miss out because he's been at every game maskless so far. You got about 20 seconds. He would miss out on seeing his grandson play. Well, unlike his grandson, my son does not have another year. I will not allow him to quarantine. And if she wants to issue me an order, she can take my butt to court because I am done. Darren Rushing. Hello, Darren Rushing, resident of Port Huron. Um, I don't have a speech written today, but after everything that's been said, it's a pretty tough act to follow. Um, I will bring up several things about the health director and the the warnings, I guess. I, I was the one that initially said, you know, possibly fire her last time. Well, her response was to tighten the screws, put in more restrictions. Well, like everybody said, the statistics, they don't match. Anything that's asked to be proven, nobody can prove it. Okay. Um, Sort of like uh, Denzel Washington from Philadelphia. Explain this to me like I'm a four-year-old. Because that's who we're picking on. Now, obviously, with everybody here, we're going after each other's kids, or at least the health department is. We're not going to stand for that. I think that's pretty obvious. Well, um, whatever the mechanism is, as far as the health director and her authority, whether it's dismissal, whether it's censure, whether it's reprimand, or whenever she makes a decision, she has to provide the legal basis, run it through co corporate counsel, run it through the count, you know, commissioners. There has to be some form of accountability and some form of proof. This can't just be a simple de decision based upon an appointed individual. It's been proven at this point hundreds of times that the directives that have come out are not backed by the science. They're not backed by any evidence-based practices, which is what they're supposed to do. And again, when we asked about corporate counsel, we asked about the thing about due process and serving warrants and arrests. All of those mechanisms are broken or don't exist. Well, they need to exist. If we're gonna go down that road, then it has to be done properly or the county can be sued for all sorts of malfeasance. Well, let's do that. Or let's hold the county, you know, let, let's hold the health director accountable. Um, you got about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, uh, Representative Beeler's here somewhere. Um, I don't know. He was, he had oh, work. okay. There's currently three bills in the Senate that are going to pass that are going to make mask mandates illegal. The counties that 
The counties that surround St. Clair County, there are no emergencies. There's no, there's no pandemic. There's no, there's no, there's nothing like we have. Please wrap it up. Okay. And um, my question is, is why? Let's, let's actually prove it. Mary Conlon. Hi, my name is Mary Conlon. I live up in Lakeport. Um, I've been in St. Clair County. Um, I've lived in St. Clair County the majority of my life, minus three years. Um, I just have a couple of questions. And I have one story. My question is, if you have a respiratory protection, or if, you have, if you're requiring masks, according to OSHA, my OSHA, what is your respiratory protection plan? And who's doing your fit testing? And who's required to be fit tested? And I'm asking this in regards to any employee and any student. Um, my next question is, can you provide a variant sample of COVID-19? No. 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 CDC can't, nobody can. So if you're given a PCR test, what all does a PCR test recognize? Does it recognize the flu? Does it recognize a sinus infection? Because I'm... On uh, February or August 24th, I was diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection, a sinus infection. Three other of my friends were diagnosed with the same thing. I took a PCR test, came back positive. My friends were all came back negative, and they were all given medicine for a sinus infection. So my doctor did the PCR test. I'm under my doctor's care. I receive a letter from the county health department, but before that I received a phone call from St. Clair County Health Department. I stated I'm under my doctor's care and that according to HIPAA law, they did not have a right to have my phone number or my information. Amen. They said, okay, fine. They hung up the phone. I got a call from the state, same exact thing. I'm under my doctor's care. I took the PCR, test through my doctor. According to my HIPAA law, you do not have the right to have my information. Okay. That was on between the 24th and the 30th. On the 30th, here's a letter that was mailed out. And I feel like they threatened me to come and arrest me when I was under quarantine already. Domestic terrorism. What gives yeah, you the right? The well, sure. Yeah, I had an upper respiratory. I had an upper respiratory infection. What all does that PCR test? <laughs> they can't. So I'm, I'm livid. I am really livid. I should not have to look out my front door to see if there's a sheriff out there waiting to arrest me. So, if you all want a copy, I'll make a copy of this letter. Please wrap it up. So, it needs to stop. Oh, and what she stated that no letters were sent out. And they have none, not done anything. At the September 2nd meeting, she stated they have not done right. anything. And no letters were Elizabeth Ely. Elizabeth? Yes. I'd like to say first that I fully support Geneva Biven's very well written resolution. I urge you to approve it. I am a fourth generation resident of Port Huron. 
Uh, when I lived in New York, I worked on media relations with the team of expert witnesses that ended so-called HIV criminalization in 24 or 15, 2014 or 15. We won that case because the highest military court in the United States did not wish us to bring in evidence that the PCR and the antibody tests were fraudulent for di diagnosing any pathogen. The PCR test is the one currently being passed off as the COVID test. I'm here because I was disturbed by what I saw on YouTube Live at the last meeting as you cited your responsibility to save us from some clear and present danger we don't think we need protection from. Except you took no responsibility for studying the science yourself and asking intelligent questions about it. At least twice you stated that you didn't really mean that parents would be arrested or prosecuted for not complying with quarantine orders. You just wanted to get their attention. You were assured by your lawyer, Mr. Corporation Counsel, that you would get away with it as no lawsuits on this ever succeed. And if Mr. Corporation Counsel were here, I would inform him that this changes the moment that any of the evidence I'm about to give is admitted to any court. There's no responsibility here, but anyway, I prefer accountability. You're accountable to the public, your bosses, which you took an oath to respect, even if some of them are crazy. I get it. You're accountable to the science, and the law will not save you if the science is fake. Yeah, it's fake. Dr. Mercatant presented her PowerPoint slides full of garbage science from the CDC, and the state, and she assured you that there were no adverse effects from any local vaccinations, while the audience, given no chance to respond or question, felt they had no choice but to heckle her. The nerve. I have some questions, cases, based on what? Test results, PCR, already discredited by the very scientist who invented that? Yeah, about 30 seconds. Stats from the CDC and the state. Agendas here, conflicts of interest, politics, or pure as the riven snow. Adverse effects. Did she mean any adverse effects or did she misspeak? Meaning only serious adverse effects. Where is the threshold for serious? Are these reported to her locally or does she rely on national statistics as reported in the official VAERS database, which is racking up deaths and morbidities off the charts? Yep. Okay, it looks like my time is up. If you could wrap it up, please. Huh? Is that it? I, I guess so. <laughs> Thank you. I have more. Okay, we're done with the citizens wishing to address the board section. We're going to move on, unfinished business. David, you had some stuff you wanted yeah, to Yeah, what address. I want to do is I want to make a motion that the county commissioners instruct our county administrator to issue a letter to our county health director to rescind her quarantine orders. Going to be doing some discussion here. I need a second before we're going to have any discussions on this. And the quieter we can be, the better the meeting will go. So Just got a question for seeing this board. is not on the agenda. Do we have to make it an agenda item? Usually you just can't take stuff and put it on the agenda when it's not, you know. We do that all the time. And acquiescence, past history, we did a revised agenda. We do this almost every time before the start of a meeting. Almost every meeting we do, we do it at the board meeting that night. Just like you're going to be addressing this. Uh, oh, intercept agreement. Yes, the intercept agreement. That wasn't on until we came here tonight. And that's all I did. We do it all the time. Yeah, that was on previous. And I, I mean, so be it. Um, we also didn't finish the questions. Our corporate counsel. Uh, said he would get me back answers. He didn't get me back a single answer. And all the questions I asked him, and I want to discuss that tonight. And we do have a second, so we can open it up for questions, unless you're going to stop the conversation. 
No, not at all. I just like I, I would like to I guess get uh, Dr. Mercantant back in here and Gary and to be able to talk about it and stuff. And um, well, she's almost always here to... when she has an, an agenda item that addresses her. Yeah, I'm just. I mean, to do it, I have no problems. If I'm you know, talking about discussing where we want to go with it, but still give the opportunity for corporate counsel and Annette to be in here to. We can do that next meeting. It's talk, meeting talk about and continue the conversation. Yeah. Because if you have some unfinished, if you have some answers that Gary hasn't gotten back to you. He hasn't. I, I've got lots and lots of documentation that he was incorrect on. And I'll present it. And anybody else, I can start with what I've got currently. So you, there should be a mechanism where you at least get it to Gary. Because you, you, there's got, you, so you, I, you, I you, you. Last meeting, I gave it to him the same stuff I gave. So I let's, it to him last meeting. Let's, let's give him the opportunity to respond to that. And then let's bring it up. Wait, please keep it down. And then let's and we can talk about this at the, the next meeting. I, mean, no, I want to talk about it tonight. I have to talk a about. Okay. All right. Uh, please, please. Uh, we have a motion in a second. I'll start it out. And one of the things I brought up to him in regards, and this is at our county website. This is what Dr. Mercantant put on the website. What's required and what's recommended. Here's the state in regards to quarantine. This is what the state is doing. They, what, this is what they should do. If she would have let, sent out a letter to everybody saying this is what you should do in regards to a quarantine, that's what the state is. I got every page that the state has. You guys can go to the state and get it yourself. In addition, her order starts out, and this is what I brought up to you, uh, corporate counsel. 2453, the wording that she puts in her order is nowhere close to what the actual law is. So they made three, day, three pages of determinations on a law that does not exist. So please, you guys have had the law, I'm sure you had it in front of you. I gave a copy to the corporate counsel, told them that what she's referencing does not exist. I've got the law that states, and it, it is not what this says. So from that pace, from right there, this should be null and void, but they come up with three pages of what should and shouldn't be done. On section I, and I'm gonna bring up the 14th Amendment and read that, but on section I, we have two uh, bureaucrats, our county health director and our corporate counsel that are dictating to 160,000 residents. They cannot be held accountable because they're not elected officials. But in part of her, his order, or hers, I imagine it's both of them, because I'm sure he reviewed this. It states, administrative relief from this order may be granted in appropriate circumstances. A person aggrieved of this order must first notify the St. Clair County Corporation Council of all the reasons that this order should not apply to them. Within two business days following said notice, the one lady got a notice. If she's aggrieved, she has to talk to the person that wrote this. That is not following the 14th Amendment, which I'll, I'll get to. And also the uh, Supreme Court ruling on that exact issue. Um, or modifying this order as it applies to that specific person. After this response, if that person is still aggrieved of that order, that person may seek judicial review, which means that that person actually has to sue the county, not the other way around. It's actually gonna give the county due process, not the individual that are receiving these letters. And that is not what our 14th Amendment. I'll continue, and anybody can interrupt if you got things to say. 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's you exactly. Again, a little bit slower, so they can I'm sorry, a little slower? <laughs> a little slower. All right, yeah. We're all worked up a little bit, so. Uh, but that's the basis of the first section of the 14th Amendment. And that's the due process of equal protection. We're not giving our residents that affordability. And I want all of you to consider that. If she's gonna do it, and now I'll make reference to Oakland County, I got their paperwork too. Every single order that Oakland has done, as the state law dictates, 
you have to have an emergency order in place. She cannot do a quarantine order without first issuing the emergency order. Macomb County is the same, Wayne County. Wayne County does not have a quarantine. What is there, 1.6 million people there? Look at Oakland County, very similar. They do not have a quarantine order. Much more congested people. Macomb County, and I believe uh, the county administrator there took a very firm position. Um, now I'm going to go to the Supreme Court ruling. This was in 1954. Separate but equal was formally abandoned which means that, and I'll go on more of it, that there's no place in the Constitution that means you can be discriminated against because of your health condition. And that's exactly what Dr. Mercantan is doing. Separate are inherently unequal. That's right in the Constitution, or in the Supreme Court ruling. It, it, questions, Commissioner? So, you're, so I just want to be clear. So your motion is to have her stop the quarantine Order. Have us issue a letter, because she has the authority as the health director, but we have the authority to fire her if she doesn't follow our direction, because we represent 160,000 people. Thank you. Right. So, okay. so, so just your motion is to stop the quarantine orders. Have it rescinded. Have it, have it to, to request it to be rescinded. Yes. Okay. And I have much, much more stuff that I have here. Uh, some people... I gave a letter to our uh, county administrator, Dr. Merkentant wasn't here, because I had some correspondence with some of the residents here, that they turned a FOIA, they have not received a response. That's illegal. Whether she wants to not give them the answers they want, but she has to give an answer. Now, Carrie Hepting has my, this is my FOIA, for specific questions. And she informed me that some of the school districts, I have to contact them to get some of these answers. But what I'm, one of them I don't have to get is a total of all quarantine you know, St. Clair County citizens with the dates and locations. I don't need a specific identification of the people. What I do want to know is how many people have been quarantined and have been not afforded their due process. And I know if I was given one of those letters, hopefully you read Dr. Mercantant's order. I don't understand it. And if I ever got one of these, I would say, I don't understand it until I do. You need to take me to court because I'm not going to follow your orders. Please, please, no talking. That, this, we, have, we have a lot of business to take care of. Um, <coughs> corporate counsel, he made reference to ADA, uh, American Disabilities Act. That has nothing to do with due process. He said we were not discriminating against. The Supreme Court case I just ruled, separate but equal, was abandoned. You cannot have orders on health issues. They're, please, go look in the Constitution, see if it's in there. And I think we need to do for our due diligence as county commissioners. But back to the CDC. Gary Fletcher brought up that the CDC can direct mask wearing on our school buses. They cannot, and in their CDC, it's on there. They are recommending that cooperating with state and local entities they have no authority in state, just as they ruled in court in Florida yesterday for their uh, governor I down thought there. Gary said public transportation, the school bus that they could not mandate, they could mandate on public transportation. That's not what he said. Correct me, did he? Uh, that's okay. That's not what he said. And he's saying, and that's what she has in her order. So, so what is we, required? If we make a motion to rescind, and if we, if we do that tonight. Yes. We st still should have the ability, right, for Gary and then that to be able to Eventually, come in and they, talk they about their position and time. everything else to, I don't want to say, put them on notice or get more information, you know, so on and so forth. But uh, Well, my motion is to rescind it. If, the, uh, if it passes, it does. If it doesn't, and I am asking for a roll call vote so we're all being oh, held accountable. Oh. So there again, if we, we'll, we'll put this up yep. for a vote, rescind. We vote to rescind. As they stands. still have the opportunity to come back, and if they have to put something, I mean, I'm just, I'm, right, I'm right. Too, I mean, because we're hitting, because we're, we're putting this on the table tonight. Gary's not here, obviously, and that's not here, you know. Um. So I think my only question is that 
you know, because I agree, we do add things to the agenda. We did it tonight. Can we add in your issue to the agenda without, but without a, a backup? Like I, I had the agreement this afternoon. I didn't get I it till three thirty. Right this afternoon. Okay. I mean, hours ago, right before the meeting. But I, but I had something in my hands to look at, right? Right. Um, I feel like if this is going to be discussed, I think we should have made sure. You're that telling that me you've never been in a meeting where we brought something up and we had no previous information. We've had final no, action. No, but you usually have the people sitting in the room to be yeah. able to talk about or, the issue. Or the, always. Or the I mean, so like, you know, I mean, so, I ask a so that's prior. the thing is like. Not always. Given you're going to say we've done that 100%. I'd say that you're not being truthful. So, okay, Dave, it's new to me. Okay, new to me. It's been done. Been, I'll take your word for it, but it's not. I've, I've always had something. So you want your motion is to to have Harry have the county send a letter to have our county administrator express our wishes to the county health director to rescind the current quarantine order. And if I can't, because I do want to get the meeting going on, part of her. Um, yeah. No, I think we. You guys, any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Dave? So your motion is just what you said. We're going to ask, the motion reads that we're going to ask the Carrie to send a letter to Dr. Mercantant asking her to rescind. Yes. The and the county commissioners, however the vote falls, the health director will know where we stand as county commissioners to rescind the quarantine order. So the way um, I do have a quote that I came up with because we come up with other quotes. One is from Benjamin Franklin that, uh, see if I can remember it here, is those that I will give up their freedoms for a little safety don't deserve either. That's the short oh. version of it. <laughs> and here's my quote from myself. Our job is to keep and maintain the freedoms guaranteed in the US Constitution. Amen. If we do not do that, nothing else matters. That's right. Mr. Okay. Chairman, do any chance we could take a restroom break? <laughs> Want to take and I that. could, I've got other stuff, but I think you get my point. I, does anybody else have anything else? Okay, let's. So, can I just to make sure that I have? Let's do this. And then okay, for the record, it's, it's, uh, your motion was to, to the county board of commissioners would direct the county administrator to uh, send a letter to the uh, health director rescinding the quarantine order. Correct. And okay. there's a second, Dave? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let's. Um, uh, roll call. Commissioner Beaton. No. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. I wish I had more time. I, I don't like the things thrown out like this. I liked the wording of the resolution. I like the wording of the re resolution from Ms. Bivens. None of that can be discussed now because this is where we're going. Yes, it can go. The resolution is a completely different issue. We can put that on our agenda for next month. We also have the agenda for the resolution. That you you got to vote. Yeah. Okay. So, but that, that, I guess that was my statement. So my vote right now is no. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Chairman Bowman. Yes. Resolution passes 5-2. Thanks. So we are going to take a five minute bathroom break, then we are going to get into our new business on our agenda. You're more than welcome to hang around. You're more than welcome to leave or it's your point. Well, send an email.
Levin B, approval of county disbursements. This time I'd like to move to approve the August 2021 county disbursements in the amount of $31,458,426.77. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. McConnell. Yes. Mr. Beaton. Yes. Mr. Rushing. Yes. Mr. Vandenbosch. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Baldwin. Yes. Chairman Bohm. Yes. Uh, item C, the Board of Canvassers appointments. I would make a motion to approve the county canvassers appointments of the Democratic Party, Rachel Dickinson, and the Republican Party, Dean Boldreff. Support. Just as a note, they both currently serve in those positions. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Item D, the contract approval request. I make a motion to renew the agreement with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for probate court services for a term of October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2022 in the amount of $73,300. Support. Discussion. Roll call. Uh, Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Chairman Bohm. Yes. Item E, Community Health Improvement Plan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve the agreement with Mary Cushing Consulting LLC for a Community Health Improvement Plan in the amount not to exceed $11,100. $11, Support. Discussion. Roll call. Uh, Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Chairman Bohm. Yes. Item F, the contract addendum approval request. Mr. Chair, I'd uh, uh, move to approve addendum the addendum to the agreement with the St. Clair County Community Mental Health Authority for Public Guardian Services renewing the term of the agreement to October 1st, 2021 mm -hmm. through September 30th, 2022 and increasing in the amount of $119,000. Support. Discussion. Roll call. <laughs> Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Chairman Bowman. Yes. Um, the item G. I uh, would like to make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 crime victims right program application in the amount of $162,370. Support. Discussion. All in favor. Aye. 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 Those opposed. Item H, the landfill engineering agreement. This time I'd like to move to approve the two year extension of the landfill engineering master services agreement with CTI and Associates Incorporated in the amount of $2,800,000. Support. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Baldwin. Yes. Mr. Vandenbosch. Yes. Mr. Beaton. Yes. Mr. Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Dunn? No. Commissioner McConnell? No. Chairman Bohm? Yes. Item I, Resolution 21-16. I make a motion to adopt Resolution 21-16, pledging full faith and credit for the Holland Drain Drainage District. Support. Uh, uh, we got to do a roll call on that. Can, can we Discussion? loan money out of any other accounts? So I let Carrie talk because because we do actually some general fund money. We have given it to Bob before and then. So we, we have used some available cash for short term notes. However, the amount of cash available to do that is very limited and we were kind of maxed out on that. Um, and it was causing some of our funds to be <coughs> in deficit just because of how we have to account for it. So that was scaled back a couple years ago, the amount that is loaned out. But couldn't, and we're not allowed to use, say, like the delinquent tax fund with the amount of money that's there. Couldn't we, instead of having money sit in a, in a savings account at 0 0.0025? So that's what we were doing technically. It has to be invested 
in the items under the public act. Um, and that's not one of them. And it, there, there were complications with it through the audit, and we were able to show it more like a do to do from other funds, um, and we were able to gain that interest. Um, however, it, it did cause some some issues with our funds being in deficit and having to do deficit elimination plans to the state of Michigan. Okay. All right. I just thought that it would be a good way to yeah. Roll call. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Uh, Chairman Bohm. Yes. Uh, item J, the 2021 budget adjustments. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the 2021 budget adjustment as presented. Support. Uh, discussion. Roll call. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Chairman Bohm. Yes. Uh, the item K, the manning table changes. I would make a motion to approve two full-time clerk two positions to two public <coughs> health nurses and one public health nurse coordinator to the health department manning table. Support. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? 2022 Medicare Advantage Renewal. Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the 2022 Medicare Advantage Renewal documents as presented. Support. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? <clears throat> uh, manning table request. This time I move to approve the addition of a full-time case manager to the public guardian's manning table. Support. Support. Discussion. Sorry, Dave. Sorry, All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Seasonal snow removal. This time I'd like to make a motion to approve the agreement for seasonal snow removal and salting services with Kevin's Lawn and Snow for a three-year period in an amount not to exceed $66,690.50 per year. I'll support now that I realize it's not seasonal snow and sailing services. <laughs> I looked at it and I thought, what are sailing services? I don't know, but I want some. I got a quick funny story. So I graduated with Kevin. Actually, he's a year older than I am. And he started his landscaping business back when we were in school. And like nobody hired people to cut their grass back then. They used to do it and everything else. And I mean, that's how long ago. That's 30. I just had my 35 year reunion until 36 years ago. So he's been doing a good job for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item O. Oh. Should that be a roll call with money? Oh, I'm sorry, roll call. <laughs> my fault. My fault. Yep. It's, it's exciting. Commissioner Vandenbosch. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Beaton? Yes. Commissioner Baldwin? Yes. Uh, Commissioner McConnell? Yes. Chairman Bohm? Yes. Item O. I would make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 secondary road patrol grant application for the sheriff's office in the amount of $78,192. Support? Uh, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item P, the Goodles County Park Playground Equipment Purchase. Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the purchase of playground equipment for the Goodles County Park from Landscape Structures in the amount of $250,789. Support? So Nancy was going to put this on the agenda for next month. They had a 5% increase. This was already laid out in her capital expenditure budget, so she brought it in so she could get it done before price increase in October, um, October 1. So it's that's crazy right. stuff, right? I mean, you look at what 250,000 buys you in playground equipment and it's yeah. not like it's as big as this building, right? And you'd think it should be, Yeah. but yeah. it's all designed properly. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Chairman Bone. Yes. Item Q, the Aeronautics Advisory Board. This time I'd like to re make a motion to reappoint William McKelvey to the Aeronautics Advisory Board, member at large for three year term expiring September 30th, 2024. Support. Uh, discussion. Just 
quick one on the airport. Kathy was at the Michigan something airport association. She sent me a text that it's not looking that red hot for that crosswinds funding Pontiac, some of the other airports. So she's going to continue to search for it, but there's a good chance that, um, some of those monies can go away, which is not good for the county, you know, as far as federal monies and all that other stuff. So we'll continue to pick away at it. Um, all in favor. Aye. 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 Those opposed. Item R. This time I'd like to make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 traffic enforcement program grant application in the amount of $56,601. Support. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Item S, the intercept agreement. This time I move to approve the intercept agreement with the Economic Development Alliance of St. Clair County, which upon occurrence of an accrued, uncured event of default permits Eastern Michigan Bank to intercept future appropriations from St. Clair County to pay down the loan. Support. Really what this is is to be able to extend, we were trying to figure out a way to extend uh, a line of credit to the EDA for their building. They have an end mortgage, there's an 80% you know, um, loan from the, um, oh geez, US, not the USDA, one of the agencies. But they needed to get a line of credit to be able to pay their bills and then you know, anybody that's built homes or whatever, you had to do this. Um, so this was a mechanism that we had to put in place to be able to get them a line of credit. I've got a few questions because I may be know on this. Uh, the, the, the future boards, Gary explained this to me when I was the township supervisor in regards to road funding, that you cannot tie the hands of a future board. This contract will do that. This potentially, because of past practice, we have $300,000 a year. What if we determine as a board and property ever goes in the tank. We're only going to get fifty thousand. This agreement, this agreement goes away when the building's done. This is purely for them to be able to set up a line of credit to be able to build the building for the next year and a half. Right. So let's say the bottom. I'm just protect the county first. Uh, we may decide as the county board next year we're giving zero dollars to the EDA. Well, this intercept agreement, they're not going to intercept any funds. If this board determines no money's going to EDA, correct? Is that correct, Carrie? Uh, yes, so this does not bind us to pay any certain amount to the EDA in the fact, in the event that they do default. Um, you know, we currently do pay 300,000, but if the board does decide we're only gonna pay 100,000, then they can only intercept what we pay. So we're, we're under no obligation to continue to fund them at the level we are today. Um, and of course they got, see if I'm correct, because you know this very well, Jeff, they have a three and a half million dollar grant that they have received to build the new building. Correct. Is this to upgrade the building to 4.25 million? No, this is purely for float because they're again, they have an end mortgage on it. It's a requirement. It could that, be perceived that way that they're yeah. asking for an addition. Yeah, no, no, no. This is purely, this gives them the ability to set up a line of credit. So they're able to pay the bills. Then when like anything, then anybody to build homes or whatever, you got to go to the bank. And you got to get your money's re. They don't. They don't have the ability to. Well, of course, EDA has done a lot of good fund. stuff. There's a couple things I didn't agree with, but uh, I think they've done a lot of good things in the county. Um, and I can ask any of the board members, maybe Jay also. Are you allowed to vote on this, being vice president of EDA? I think there's a conflict of interest if you did. Mm, that, I mean, I'll sustain. I mean, we vote on a lot. We vote on a lot of, a lot of stuff to. So yeah. do I need to abstain, abstain when we're? ordering equipment from for the emergency management or do you, do you receive any benefit from sitting on that board that's appointed from do you get paid for sitting on the board no i do not receive any so also that isn't a mandatory position as the county commissioner your the position you're talking is a mandatory. yeah i'll say hey i'll sustain it's well, no i'm just trying to get where we're coming from i mean every every so i i go in this morning i was sitting at a meeting where we had central dispatch. So Tina is gonna come in looking for an extra employee. So do I have to abstain because I sit on the central You're dispatch? You're appointed to that board as a county commissioner because that's a county entity. The EDA is not. Just like if I go to the road commission, I don't abstain from the road commission. You sit there as a representative. Saying hey, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I'll sustain, all right? <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, you're right, we David. We need to be perceived to be 
no. Well, we should no, no gray area. Yeah. And that's just the way I am. You yeah. can vote however you want. Yeah, let's get it. I want to hear, hear, hear from Jay for it's a second. Just I'm, my perspective from being in these. So ultimately, the, the, the obligation resides with Chairman Bohm to determine if he has a conflict. Um, because truthfully, your obligation, when I say your, I mean you collectively here, your obligation is to vote on all matters that come before you. Because if you don't, you could start cherry picking matters that you might not look good if you vote a certain way on. So you just abstain from voting. So ultimately what that means for Chairman Bohm is that he has to decide if his involvement with the EDA is a conflict potentially that could bias him in a determination on whether you guys agree. And I always thought the, conf and and I always thought the conflict right. arose like Dukes had to opt out because their companies bid on stuff before, because right. their company has a financial gain. Jeff Bohm has no financial gain sitting on the board. But we'll, we'll clarify that at a later date. I'm not going to lose my any no, sleep over, but, yeah. but I'll sustain. I've got one question on it. This doesn't involve the shortfalls they've got because of the grant issues because of the billing. Yeah, and we're not even sure of that yet. Some material costs right, coming material down, costs. you know, correct. And it has nothing to do with that. Okay. Yeah, no. Th this is purely a line of credit right. for cash flow because their grant is on a reimbursement basis. So they have to pay the cash up front, and then the line okay. of credit will be paid back with their grant reimbursements. Oh. Roll call. Uh, Commissioner McConnell. Yes. Commissioner Vandenbosch. Yes. Commissioner Baldwin. Yes. Commissioner Rushing. Yes. Commissioner Beaton. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. It's the first time I've ever um, abstained in 17 years on this board, just for the record. <laughs> it's just a good chunk of money. I, I, item 12, administrator's report. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've. Um, Commissioner Baldwin touched on it a little bit earlier. Our Gypsy Moth program is underway. Um, we have had over 500 citizens go on to our online form and self-report. So the Friends of the St. Clair River has been working through that. They're starting to do some preliminary surveillance and contacting people. They've been returning the phone calls and the emails. And they do have um, three educational workshops coming up that a press release will be going out in a day or so on that. Um, as far as for monitoring activities and just um, general education for anyone that's interested. Um, we covered dispatch. Earlier this week, um, Jenny Posey and myself met with um, Rich McKeegan from ASM and Gino at the Convention Center for our annual meeting and update that we do. Uh, the Convention Center business is actually looking really good for next year. All of those events that we were not allowed to have, many of them were postponed. So our 2022 calendar is actually looking pretty full, which is good news for us. Um, and even now we're starting to see things pick up, you know, meetings, events, and um, hopefully even later this year, a trade show. We have received the proposals back from our internal departments on using the American Rescue Plan Act funds. If you recall, we asked departments to submit any projects that they have that they feel would qualify under the rules of those funds. It's approximately $1.1 million worth of projects. We are reviewing them internally, um, following up with the departments on questions just to see if, if they do qualify and they fall under those different categories that we're allowed to use them for. So I, I don't have the final number on which of those qualify yet. Um, some of them we had follow-up questions and I think some we're going to reach out to our associations like MAC and NACO because we just weren't really quite sure if they, if they would or wouldn't qualify into one of the categories. Uh, after the last um, full board meeting, I did reach out to Ken Cummings from Tri Hospital EMS, and we have been able to sit down and meet to discuss um, ambulance funding proposals on how that would work. Um, he did provide me with a bunch of reading information that I've started going through most of that. But I think we kind of came up with the county itself is really not involved in ambulance and ambulance funding. It's each local unit that contracts with a provider. So our current model, basically a fee for service, um, going through that is just not sustainable and how the, how the reimbursements come through and the different um, insurances. 
So um, Tri Hospital Ken has been reaching out to township supervisors and going to meetings and going through this. And there is a lot of support um, that he's hearing back from the local units on the potential for millage versus individual contracts where it would come out of their budgets. But we do think it might be best to have um, small work group with some municipal leaders, um, perhaps a commissioner on there, because if the board is interested in putting a millage question on the ballot we, for next year, we really want to get that process moving because those deadlines will come up quick. So um, I, I was able to talk to Commissioner McConnell about it a little bit earlier, and he did indicate that Commissioner Vandenbosch, you have an interest in and in being involved in and in being on that committee. So, uh, Carrie, I talked extensively with Jeff White, who does Lennox. He does not need any funding. He does not want any funding. He's in good shape, and he takes care of my area, of course. What he and I talked about is that each township, and Georgia would know this, they don't need to get a millage approval at the township level. Whoever they represent, they can do a special assessment right at the board. And whatever monies that Tri Hospital needs, I don't know if it's a million dollars, you can throw anything out there if they need to raise a million dollars to give the service that is required. They go to the municipalities they have, this is the special assessment I need from you and do it on a user basis. And I've done this with Jeff White and the fire departments that service Riley when I was township supervisor. They give you a basis of the runs made in yours. So your basis of the cost for what happens in Riley Township is based on a five-year average. So you don't get hit with a big hiccup one year. Like if Riley, if they had 100 runs one year, 20 runs the next year, they don't get an 80% reduction. It goes on a five-year average. And that's what Jeff White and I talked about. How does the city, a city camp specialist assess? Yes, they, well, Jay would know this. I believe a city can't. Can. I don't know. So they, have, they have taxation. Um, ability that is a lot higher and it's a lot more liberal for the usage of those dollars allocated actually you would probably have, you know that let's thing. check into that let's just get yeah. clarification i think it should be just from my initial discussion with jeff white see if tri hospital can do it with the entities the municipal entities they can do and say this is what i need for you whatever they're doing after they service sport crash it if 30 percent of their runs are there they need 30 percent of the funds above and beyond what they currently have just to maintain good service so they don't need a huge I don't believe they need a huge to get the thing continually running well, the, the problem you're going to run into is so you're you're basically saying that Muzzy Yale Lynn Brackway all of those townships are going to pay a huge amount because if if we don't do this and, and we don't do a countywide millage right. and we go individually the city of Port Huron doesn't need to do it at all because they have enough runs. Do you have any idea how much money they need to raise to maintain the service? Is a million too much, 500,000? No, um, a, a million dollars would help them with operation. They're looking at a million dollar shortfall and that's just operationally. Now once um, equipment needs to be maintained, new equipment purchased, you know, that would well, be sitting in here and do a presentation. Yeah, because yeah. what we did in Riley Township, we actually, in addition to the uh, contract to Memphis and Emmett, there's an equipment fund on there too that you pay every annual too, so it covers the equipment cost. And I think they can do it. If, if it's only a million, uh, Lynn Township was the poorest one you got, maybe all they can give is 15,000, 20,000. Well, that's the way it's going to work out anyways, right? Because you're going to do it. The usage, yes. No, you're going to do it, if you do it on a millage, so if we do do a half mill, countywide mill, it's no different than our Parks and Rec or whatever. So we don't go and say we're not going to put a park out in okay. in uh, Berlin Township because they don't pay as much taxes as they do it downriver. Right. So, um, but Jeff White already gets a a he gets a he's a private entity and but he, he also gets the city of Richmond and the city of and the township of Lennox already they're supporting it they're supporting it and then they he does direct billing. Same as the taxpayers doing Marysville. What's that? The taxpayers of Marysville support the ambulance. Right. So in Marysville, the money would the 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 appropriation, if this would go through, Marysville would receive that half mil because they already have their own ambulance service. And the same thing would happen to you. Jeff says he doesn't want it, but I can bet you when Richmond finds out, 
that they're su they're subsidizing your townships. Why why they are? I Who doesn't want that. it? Right. Right. Yeah. Then he would, and I'm just, just discussion. I think. Uh, uh, let's hey, let's get. I'm just. I'm trying to. But let's get Ken in here, and then we can have a count because we're saying he said, she said, right, that, right. Blah, blah, blah. Get him up in there here, and let's get have some him ideas, and he'll decide what's in best interest. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, just two more things, I promise. <laughs> So you approved our Medicare Advantage renewal this evening. We did receive our preliminary numbers for Blue Cross for our active employees, and our renewal came in um, basically flat. They went up, you know, a couple tenths of a percentage. So that's that's, we'll, that's, awesome. that's great. Again. I know. Hopefully that contract will come before you next month. We don't got a lot of use. <laughs> and last, our airport manager search. Um, the the position has been posted, and I've begun receiving applicants. Um, at this time, I think I'm going to leave the position open or posted until it's full. Kathy's official retirement date is December 1st, so we are looking to get somebody in and have a overlap period of time. It's a very specialized field, and um, to have somebody come in and be able to work with her for a couple weeks before she retires. And that's all I have this evening. So we're going to okay. bring somebody on and then tell them they're going to have a huge shortfall in their budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the FAA funding. Yeah, FAA, good luck now. Uh, <laughs> uh, motion to receive the uh, minister's report. So moved. Support. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, no miscellaneous business. Any miscellaneous business come for us. Kudos to Commissioner Vandenbosch for his little event down there that he had. It was awesome. I'm probably the most hated man in Marine City, but that's another story for another day. Receive and file. I make a motion to receive and file. Support. Support. All in favor. Aye. 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 Adjournment. So moved. Support. Support. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye